Aloha. Thank you for joining us here at TruthMadeEasy.com as we continue with our Apologetics Made Easy video training course. In this video, we will be talking about miracles as we work our way through our five points here in our five-point hand illustration. Let's quickly run through those for you now. Point one is proving that God exists. We've already done that and proved beyond a reasonable doubt that God exists, doing so without using the Bible. Instead, we proved his existence using science, reason, and philosophy. Point two, if God exists, miracles are possible. Point three, the New Testament is historically reliable. Simplified, it's a good history book. We can believe what it tells us. And what does the New Testament tell us about the central figure of the New Testament? It tells us that Jesus Christ claimed to be God. And not only did he claim to be God, but he also proved he was God. That's point four, Jesus is God. Now we know that whatever God teaches is true. What did Jesus, who is God, teach? He taught point five here, that the scriptures, both the Old and New Testament, what we call today the Bible, is the Word of God. Well, with point one completed, it's time now to move on to our second point, miracles. In our prior set of videos, we proved that God exists using the cosmological, teleological, and moral law arguments. And from the evidence we studied, we learned about some of the characteristics of the beginner, designer, and moral lawgiver. And that the evidence best describes this being as a theistic God, the God of one of the three theistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. Using science, reason, and logic, we discovered that the beginner, designer, and moral lawgiver was timeless, immaterial, non-spatial, supremely intelligent, self-existent, infinite, unimaginably powerful, and morally perfect. We also discovered that these are the very same characteristics used to describe the God of the Bible, that he too was timeless, immaterial, and so on. So now we ask the question, what can we expect from a being who possesses these characteristics? Well, we can expect that God would want to communicate with us his creation. Norman Geiser and Frank Turek comment, However, since we know beyond a reasonable doubt that God exists and that he has the characteristics we've listed above, characteristics that include design, purpose, justice, and love, then we should expect him to reveal more of himself and his purpose for our lives. This would require that he communicate with us. One of the three major theistic religions is likely to contain that communication. But how? How can we expect God to communicate with us? Norma Geiser and Frank Turek suggest how. Perhaps God has manifested himself in some way to a select group of people over many centuries and inspired them to write down what they witnessed and heard from him. Written language is a precise medium of communication that can easily be duplicated and passed on to succeeding generations, yet it also can be easily ignored by those who freely decide that they don't want to be bothered with God. So a book would work as a valid, but not overpowering means of communication from God. Let's illustrate here how God communicates to us through what is known as both general and special revelation. As we have already seen in prior videos, God has revealed himself to us through creation and our conscience, what we call the moral law. Creation and conscience is known as natural or general revelation which gives us basic ideas of God's existence, his characteristics, and his moral requirements that he's infinite, unimaginably powerful, supremely intelligent, and absolutely morally perfect. As Geisler and Turek have pointed out, written language is a precise medium of communication and that a book, a book would be a good way of carrying out that communication. Theologians call this type of communication special revelation. In its written language form, it can be duplicated for others, passed on to each generation, easy to be ignored if desired, and not overpowering. Geiser and Turek then add, So a book would work as a valid but not overpowering means of communication from God. But whose book? Has God communicated through the book of the Jews, the book of the Christians, or the book of the Muslims? How are we supposed to tell whose book, if any, is really a message from God? Well, those are good questions, aren't they? Whose book or whose messenger has been used by God to communicate to us? Is it the Tanakh and Moses? Uh, is it the Bible with Jesus, the apostles, and the prophets of old? Or is it the Quran and Muhammad? 
How can we know for sure? As we'll see, miracles can help us to determine which book and through which messengers God has spoken to us. Miracles can be likened to something used in ancient times before there was a post office, email, or texting. Back then, when a king, for example, wanted to send a message, he would use a messenger to deliver it. And he would place his seal on the message so that whoever received the message knew that both the message and the messenger were authentic, that they both really came from the king and not someone else, some poser pretending to be the king. What made the king's seal so special is that it was unusual or unique, easily recognizable, and something only the king possessed. In the same way, God, the king of the universe, has attached his special seal to his messages that he sends to mankind. God's seal confirms the message and the messenger. Like the king's seal, a miracle is unusual or unique, easily recognizable, and only God can do that. So, exactly what is a miracle? Geiser and Turek provide us with this description. A miracle is a special act of God that interrupts the normal course of events. We might say that natural laws describe what happens regularly by natural causes. Miracles, if they occur at all, describe what happens rarely by supernatural causes. And they add, a miracle is an act of God to confirm the word of God through a messenger of God. Here again is our box from prior videos that we used to illustrate our time, space, material universe. We've labeled it the natural world, where nature and natural laws are at work. On the top right is God, a supernatural being who is outside or beyond the universe. We can think of a miracle as God reaching into the box and doing something that we don't normally see nature and natural laws doing, a supernatural act performed by a supernatural being. Again, a miracle is not a natural, everyday event. It is beyond the natural. It is a supernatural event. A man is limited by the natural world around him. Under his own power, he can walk, run, and jump, but he cannot fly. Natural laws, gravity, keep him on the ground. But the cartoon character, Superman, can fly. Gravity doesn't hold him down, and bullets bounce off his chest. Now, of course, this is fictional, but I use the example to illustrate the prefix there. Super. So there is man, and there is Superman. In the same way, there is the natural, and there is the supernatural. Things that don't occur naturally, such as the Big Bang fireball explosion that uh, we studied earlier. Now, knowing what a true miracle is can help us to better distinguish a miracle from other unusual events such as anomalies. For years, the bumblebee stump scientists, they couldn't figure out how it was able to fly. The size of its wings was small as compared to its body weight. This was an anomaly. Well, they later discovered that the bumblebee has a power pack of some sort that helps it to fly. Magic tricks can be quite amazing. Hey, how did he do that? But that's not a miracle. Nor are psychosomatic cures the mind healing the body. True miracles from God are certainly not related to satanic signs. And uh, one last one here, providence. When things happen in our lives as Christians, and we sense that God did something very special, we can find ourselves saying, I bet God did this or that. And while it may very well be true that God was at work, it was God using natural events in our lives, not supernatural events. The example used in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is the foggy conditions that were in place at the time of the World War II Allied invasion onto Normandy. The fog helped to hide the Allied forces as they approached France and the Nazi forces. God may have played a part in that. We don't know for certain. If he did, he did so providentially using natural laws. Fog is a natural occurring thing. There's nothing supernatural about it. An example of a true miracle would be, as Geisler and Turek illustrate in the book, bullets bouncing off the bodies of the Allied soldiers. So, providence is God using natural laws to do things, while miracles are God doing things supernaturally. So, how are we best able to test whether someone who claims to have a message from God is really giving us a true message from Him? By better understanding the characteristics of a true miracle. 
we will find that they relate in part to the three arguments we previously used to prove God's existence, the cosmological, teleological, and moral law arguments. A true miracle from God will have his fingerprints on it. It will be instantaneous, supernaturally powerful, just as the creation of the universe at the Big Bang was instantaneous and was not the result of nature or natural laws. A miracle will also be purposeful. As the great designer, miracles can be expected to be designed for a purpose, to glorify God. They're not for show or for entertainment purposes. And we know that any miracle of God will be pure, since God is absolutely morally pure and perfect. His acts, his miracles, will promote truth, not error or immorality. Now, there are about 250 miracles recorded in the Bible. Let's look at a few of them now. We'll begin with uh, a couple of well-known miracles, starting with the uh, miracle in Jericho. After marching around the walls of Jericho for seven days, we read in Joshua 6.20, When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Then there is uh, Daniel in the lion's den, who was left untouched by the hungry lions. We're told that God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths. In Daniel 6.22, Daniel speaking, My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. Then there's the miracle of Jonah and the great fish, where Jonah came out alive from the belly of that uh, great fish after being inside it for three days. You know, as we uh, read the Bible and come across the many miracles in both the Old and New Testaments, we can get the impression that miracles happen all the time. But that was not the case. We need to remember that the stories in the Bible are spread out over thousands of years. There were large gaps of time where no miracles are recorded. And when we do find them, they're often bunched up into three main periods. The lifetime of Moses, Elijah and Elisha, and Jesus and the disciples. These were the times where God was confirming his message and his messengers. During the time of Moses and the law, we have Moses with the Ten Commandments, which God himself wrote on a tablet of stone. Then there was Moses together with Aaron before Pharaoh when he performed the many miracles as instructed by God who had appeared to him in a bush. And of course, that uh, incredible miracle, the parting of the Red Sea with Moses and the Israelites crossing over on dry ground. During the times of Elijah and Elisha the prophets, we find Elijah being taken to heaven on a chariot while Elisha looks on. Then there was Elisha's prayer and the attacking armies becoming blinded. And the young child that was raised from the dead by the prophet Elisha. During the times of Jesus and the disciples in the New Testament, there are the recorded miracles of Jesus healing the sick, the miraculous catch of fish, and uh, also the layman uh, by the temple who was healed by the Apostle Peter. And there are a number of other miracles in the New Testament involving Jesus, including his birth in Bethlehem, the Incarnation, where God became a man. Then there was the uh, very well-known miracle of Jesus feeding the uh, 5,000 plus people with just five loaves and two fishes. In John chapter 2, Jesus turned water into wine at a marriage in Cana of Galilee and walked on water in John chapter 6. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus raises a 12-year-old girl from the dead and in John's Gospel, he raises Lazarus who had been dead already for four days. And then, of course, is the grandest biblical miracle of all, the resurrection of Christ, where he came back from the dead and arose alive after being in the tomb for three days, and he later followed that by ascending bodily into heaven. The life and times of Jesus and the disciples brought many special miracles as God confirmed his message and his messenger. And what a message it was. It was the message of salvation, which God confirmed, as noted here by the author of Hebrews. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. Now at this point in the course, we have not, and I repeat, we have not yet proved that the Bible is true, nor have we proved that the miracles in the Bible are true. 
We will determine both of those things as we continue through the course. But for now, we're simply saying that miracles are possible. And how do we know that? Well, because the greatest miracle of all has already occurred. The creation of the universe out of nothing. Therefore, we know that the miracles in the Bible are at least possible. For if God can make everything from nothing, it's no problem for him to raise the dead, part the Red Sea, keep Jonah alive for three days in the belly of a great fish, heal diseases instantaneously, and so on. In fact, the Bible claims that nothing is too hard for God. Jeremiah 32, 17 tells us as much. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Yet some people, like naturalists and materialists, still disbelieve in miracles. Why? Because they do not believe in God or the supernatural. Naturalists and materialists do not believe that God created the universe or living things. For them, there is only nature and the natural world, things comprised of matter, the material world. This uh, viewpoint of the naturalist and materialist was further strengthened back in the 1700s by a man named David Hume and his famous argument against miracles. In a lecture some years ago, Norman Geiser commented on David Hume and his argument. After pointing out that David Hume was the greatest skeptic that ever lived, he went on to say, David Hume devised an argument that is used to this day as the most powerful argument against miracles. If you can't answer this, you cannot defend your faith in the modern world. For the last 200 years, this argument has been used in universities, in science labs, in our entire culture to show that it is no longer credible to believe in miracles. In the book, Norman Geiser and Frank Cherick point out, Hume's argument against miracles is one of the pillars of the so-called Enlightenment. That's where we supposedly became enlightened enough to abandon our superstitious beliefs in miracles and put our faith in reason and the empirical truths found by the scientific method. Hume's argument helped advance the naturalistic worldview, which later metastasized with Darwin's theory of evolution. In uh, chapter 8 of the book, Miracles, Signs of God or Gullibility, Norman Geiser and Frank Turek go into more detail on this argument. However, in the interest of time, we'll just touch on a few of the key points here and uh, keep it simple. As Geisler and Turek show in their book, this argument is easily defeated and proved wrong. Now let's look at the five points of this argument in syllogistic form. Number one, natural law is by definition a description of a regular occurrence. Two, a miracle is by definition a rare occurrence. Three, the evidence for the regular is always greater then for the rare. For a wise man always bases his belief on the greater evidence. And lastly, find the conclusion, therefore a wise man should never believe in miracles. Now we know that the uh, first one is true. Natural laws are a description of a regular occurrence. For example, the natural law of gravity is at work every day. It's a regular event. If you let go of a pen in your hand, it does what? it falls. The pen falls, apples fall. Gravity is what Hume would refer to as a regular occurrence, an everyday thing, a natural law at work. Now how about walking on water? Is that a natural event? Something that happens regularly? No, of course not. Walking on water would be a rare occurrence, as Hume puts it. So let's go back to our list. We can now check off number two, because, as we've seen, a miracle is, by definition, a rare occurrence. How about number three? The evidence for the regular is always greater than for the rare. Well, as we're going to see, this premise is false. The evidence for the regular is not always greater than for the rare. Now, before we look at why this is false, let's first look at the last two points, number four and five. Number four tells us a wise man always bases his belief on the greater evidence. Yeah, that's true. And number five, the conclusion, therefore a wise man should never believe in miracles. This conclusion is false because premise number three is false. And why is number three false? Because the evidence for the regular is not always greater than for the rare. There is good evidence for many rare events, just as there is good evidence for regular events. Allow me to explain. 
Most naturalists and materialists believe that the universe began at the Big Bang, with the natural world following that. Many also believe that the first life spontaneously generated here on planet Earth, with all other life forms evolving from that first life gradually over time. Now I ask you, are these regular events that have occurred over and over again? Or would you say that these are rare one-time events? Right, these are rare one-time events. So, based on Hume's argument, premise number four, like a wise man, naturalists and materialists should not believe that rare events like the Big Bang, the first life, and evolution really occurred. Yet they do believe. What Hume's argument is saying is that unless something happens over and over again, unless it's a regular event, a wise person should not believe it. So we see that premise three is flawed, and so is Hume's argument. Something doesn't have to happen over and over again. It doesn't have to be a regular event before it can be believed. Believability is not based on whether something is regular or rare. It is not based on whether it happens one time, a few times, or over and over again. It's based on whether or not there is good evidence that the event has occurred. Besides Hume's argument, people disbelieve in miracles for other reasons. Let's look at a few of those reasons now. Some don't believe in miracles because of the glasses they wear, what we might call worldview glasses. The way we view or see the world, our worldview, can be affected by the type of worldview glasses we wear. For the glasses we wear shape what we see and what we don't see, and at times they can prevent us from seeing what we don't want to see. Let's take a look now at some different worldview glasses. Here we have what we'll call natural and supernatural worldview glasses. Now, if we choose to wear just the natural glasses, we will only see those things that are material in nature, things that are detectable by our five senses, things that could be seen, touched, tasted, and so on. Natural glasses cannot detect things that are beyond nature, things that are supernatural, such as God, angels, the human soul, and so on. The supernatural can only be detected by the person who wears supernatural glasses. To accurately view the world around us, we should use both sets of glasses, both natural and supernatural. Or even better yet, get ourselves a pair of special glasses that combines both together. What we might call combination glasses or combo glasses for short. A person wearing combo glasses is one who investigates things and is open to follow the evidence wherever it leads, be it natural or supernatural. Let's take a look now at a few miracles in the Bible using different sets of glasses. The New Testament tells of the miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 plus people with five loaves and two fishes. At this point in our course, we are not attempting to determine whether or not this miracle actually occurred, or if the New Testament account of the miracle is accurate and true. For now we're just asking, is such a miracle even possible? Well. To determine if this or any other miracle really occurred, one would need to investigate the evidence for the miracle. But there are many who will outright disbelieve that a miracle like this with the loaves and fishes is even possible. They will discount the event before they even investigate it. Why? Because they only wear natural glasses. No matter what they look at, they see only the natural world with natural laws. So there can be no miracle of loaves and fishes, because this is not something that occurs naturally. But the person who wears glasses that allows him to investigate things from both a natural and supernatural perspective, and is honest with the evidence, will come to a different conclusion. In looking through the right lens of their glasses, from the perspective of the natural world, they will rightly conclude that the multiplication of the loaves and fishes is not a natural regular event that occurs over and over again. But with the additional supernatural perspective of the left lens, they will look at the event and conclude, yeah, that miracle is at least possible. If God created the universe out of nothing, then multiplying loaves and fishes would be a simple thing for him to do. Whether or not the event actually occurred as the Bible teaches is another matter. That would still require more investigation, but for now it's at least possible. Same with the empty tomb and the resurrection of Christ. If a person wears only natural glasses, they will see the empty tomb and look for a natural explanation. Someone stole the body, uh, Jesus never died, or, or some other theory. 
Because they won't even put on the supernatural glasses to investigate all angles, there can be no possible supernatural explanation. But again, for the person who sees things from both a natural and supernatural perspective, they come to a different conclusion. Again, since they know that God created the entire universe out of nothing, they know that raising someone from the dead is at least believable. After a further study of the evidence, both for and against the resurrection, they can make a determination as to whether or not this particular miracle really happened. Same with our universe and the planet Earth. When a person is looking at, let's say, the origin of the universe with just natural glasses, they see only the universe and the natural world, and conclude that there is no supernatural being such as God who had part in its beginning. They see no miracle occurring here. But the person who puts on their combo glasses and examines the evidence from all angles and looks at things from both a natural and supernatural perspective and taking into consideration the Big Bang evidence we have studied in light of the cosmological and teleological arguments, they will come to the conclusion that the evidence best points to a miracle of epic proportion, the creation of the universe out of nothing by a supernatural beginner of the universe, with the characteristics matching those of the God of the Bible. Now besides Hume's argument and the glasses people wear, there's another reason why people disbelieve in miracles, and it relates to the heart. Some simply reject miracles because they reject God and anything related to Him, including miracles. For them, it's not a lack of knowledge or a lack of evidence that is keeping them from putting their trust in God. It's not a head thing. It is instead a heart thing. Some people just don't want to believe, no matter how much evidence you show them. One famous atheist, Friedrich Nietzsche, is quoted in the book as saying, If one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should be even less able to believe in Him. That's not a head thing. It's a hard thing. It's a matter of the will not wanting God. As Geisler and Turek point out elsewhere in the book, as someone once said, the distance between heaven and hell is about 18 inches, the distance between the head and the heart. But why would someone say such a thing as Nietzsche has here? Paraphrase, even if you could prove that there is a God, we're still not going to believe in him. Well, there are many reasons, a, a few that come to mind is that some believe that uh, God will take all the fun out of life and they don't like the idea of having to submit to someone else, in this case God or, or the Bible's teachings. They want to remain the boss of their lives. They want to call all the shots. They don't want to follow someone else's rules. With no God and no Bible, a person can believe they're free to live any lifestyle they choose to live. Others reject God and miracles because they think that Christians are hypocrites. And sadly, many times they're right. Or maybe they've been hurt by a Christian in the past. You may have heard the saying, the number one thing that keeps people from becoming Christians is Christians. Well, sad to say there are many not so nice Christians who have given Jesus and Christianity a black eye. There are others who reject miracles because of some scientific uh, or philosophical belief. This ties in somewhat to the uh, worldview glasses that uh, we talked about earlier, but it goes beyond that. For many in the scientific community, their belief in the Big Bang, the first life, and the theory of Darwinistic evolution and natural selection, well, it's a kind of religion. Later in the course, we'll be talking more about this when we cover the topic of evolution and the origin of the first life here on planet Earth. Regarding science as a religion, you might find this comment by Norman Geiser and Frank Turek to be interesting. Spontaneous generation of life, which Darwinism requires to get the theory started, has never been observed. It is believed in by faith. The Darwinian belief in naturalism, or materialism, is also an article of faith. Hence, Darwinism is nothing more than a secular religion masquerading as science. On the subject of science, Geiser and Turek include a quote by Richard Lewontin of Harvard University, and we quote, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs because we have a prior commitment to materialism, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. 
So for many in the science field, and those teaching science in our schools, God, miracles, and anything associated with the supernatural is purposely left out. It doesn't matter if what is believed or taught is against common sense, they cannot allow God's divine foot in the door. Okay, let's summarize uh, what we've learned in this miracles video. We've seen first of all what? God wants to communicate with man, but how? Through creation and our conscience, which is known as natural or general revelation, and through a book by means of special revelation. Since we know at this stage that one of the theistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam is the one true religion, we ask ourselves, through which book and messenger has he communicated? Through the Tanakh and Moses? Through Jesus, the apostles and the prophets in the Bible? Or the Quran and Muhammad? Well, in our search to determine this, we look to miracles. Like a king's seal, miracles confirm the message and the messenger. They are unusual, easily recognizable, and only God can do them. In answer to our question, exactly what is a miracle? We saw that a miracle is where God, a supernatural being, reaches into the box of our natural world and does supernatural acts. We already know that miracles are at least possible because the greatest miracle has already occurred, the creation of the universe out of nothing. We also learned that there are about 250 miracles in the Bible, with three time periods having the largest concentration of miracles during the times of Moses, Elijah and Elisha, and Jesus and the disciples. Yet despite the evidence for miracles, many still disbelieve in them, such as naturalists and materialists who believe there is no God, no miracles, no supernatural. They only believe in those things related to nature and natural laws, the material universe. We saw that uh, David Hume's argument against miracles from the 1700s is still being felt today in 2014, despite the fact that it has a flaw in one of its premises. When we looked at other reasons why people reject miracles, we saw how the glasses we wear shape what we see and don't see. Those wearing only natural glasses don't consider the supernatural. If something doesn't fit a natural explanation, it's not even considered. Also, many times disbelief in miracles is not due to a lack of knowledge. It's not a head thing, it's a heart thing. Like Nietzsche, even if one were to prove that there is a God, they still wouldn't believe in him. So it comes as no surprise that those who reject God also reject his supernatural acts. So at this point in the course, as I previously mentioned, we have proved that miracles are at least possible. We have not yet proved that the miracles contained within the pages of the Bible really happen, but as uh, we work through the other points in our five-point hand illustration, that the New Testament is a good history book, that Jesus is God and the Bible is the Word of God, we will build strong evidence for the Bible's truthfulness and credibility and prove indeed that miracles did happen as recorded in the Bible. That they're not made up stories or fairy tales as many skeptics claim. In fact, we are going to take a big step in that direction in our very next video as we begin point three and investigate whether or not the New Testament is a good history book, whether or not it's historically reliable. Can we believe what the New Testament tells us about Jesus Christ and the miracles he performed? Did the miracle of the Incarnation, God becoming man, really happen? Did Jesus really heal the sick, raise the dead, walk on water, turn water into wine, predict the future, and live a perfect life? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Well, the truthfulness of each of these things will depend upon the truthfulness and reliability of the New Testament documents which we'll begin to cover next in our video, The New Testament, Scribes and Manuscripts.